Hello guys, uh, this is Mark here with my uh, debut podcast here in uh, courtesy of uh, Spreaker. Um, I have a lot to cover. Uh, I only have 30 minutes to do it. And what I'd like to cover more mainly would be uh, wrestling. I do enjoy wrestling myself. I've been watching it my whole life. Um, WCW and WWE mostly. Um, I do find myself to be real familiar with uh, most of the roster from ring of honor and uh, new japan pro wrestling but uh anyway uh this sunday uh the uh sunday of a uh, fast lane uh i just want to get uh i just want to get the matches covered up that way uh you know the insight i could provide and that way you know a different perspective along the lines of um along the lines of what i of what i can provide um, the beginning match started off with uh, Calisto and Alberto Del Rio for the uh, United States Championship. Um, there was a few things to point out. Um, I began to get excited because I I saw that uh, uh, Mauro Ranello was on the commentary with JBL and uh, the uh, very unlikable Byron Saxton. Uh, it was a very good, very good match from Calisto and Alberto Del Rio. I really do think that those two together can always put on a good match despite the mismatch of size. I do really enjoy how how much of a good heel Alberto Del Rio is and him him coming out debuting at the Survivor Series really shows that we missed him a lot as a as a performer and and as a wrestler. To have him bring over some talent like Alisto is just amazing. Despite the mismatch in size, I really thought that this this two out of three falls count anywhere match was really incredible. I really enjoyed it. I found myself, um, you know, getting really excited because despite this being the pre-show match, it nonetheless was still for a title. Um, those are a few good things I, I liked as well. Um, to the things I didn't like, um, I didn't like the fact that. Um, I didn't like the fact that two out of the three falls were derived from means that shouldn't have been then should have been caused in the first place. Alberto Del Rio disqualifies himself for the first fall, um, which takes it to uh, it being really cheap the for, for time constraints, of course. The second one comes um, comes around with um, Alberto uh, doing what Sasha Banks kind of does when he has uh, the opponent on the ropes. Uh, Calisto was holding the ropes while Alberto from the, I think it was the mid turnbuckle comes off and stomps him on the chest. Um, I guess that garners, I guess that can garner a pinfall nowadays since there's a lot of few moves that uh, really shouldn't at all be able to be counted for a three pin. Um, The third fall, which Calisto was able to get uh, Alberto Del Rio Trying to trying to get him set up for the Selena Del Sol, but ends up hitting the term, uh, ends up uh, spinning him out. Instead of spinning him out towards the ring in the middle, he actually spins him towards the turnbuckle. Alberto De Rio gets uh, gets uh, uh, gets dizzy, hits the turnbuckle. Kalisto comes in with the roll up, and that's it. Um, that gives him the three count, uh, the three count pin. Mm, to me, I don't think pins should be you know that shouldn't garner a three pin um i really you know i'm really a traditional i have a really traditional point of view when it comes to wrestling i really think that um three count falls should be derived from signature moves you know it's really hard for something to be so believable like that when you see uh, a move that really doesn't isn't the on the tier of an actual finishing move. When you see that, you're going to be thinking that there's going to be a pin, uh, a count two, a close count two at least. But no, you see it actually going as a third, as a one, two, three pin. That's it. <clears throat> when you see something like that, it really, it really makes you think that maybe they were calling a bad spot or something or the other, because it, it gets, it gets you thinking is what I'm trying to say. The, um, it should have finished with the Selena Del Sol because, like you said, that move is very incredible. It's very difficult to pull off, especially for Kalisto's size. But it it should have been seen. Like I said, this was a this was a, a Cleveland, Ohio, uh, a venue, and like I said, not a lot of people have seen the move. 
uh, while he's been around. He's fairly, fairly new in the singles run. I mean, if you've seen the Lucha Dragons, you've seen the move, but to see it, to see him do that, have the finish, finish El Del Rio, and retain the title, that would have been all perfect. All perfect for a pre show match. <clears throat> okay, so we go to the main card. But before you, we get started on that, I'd like to mention that Mauro Ranello was only ava- only there for the pre-show. I don't know what is going on with that type of thing, but from you'll see a big contrast from Mauro Ranello's commentary to Michael Cole's. Michael Cole's commentary has been wearing very very thin. Um, this is this isn't my only my only. Uh, my only opinion on this. A lot of people do share an agreement with me with um, Mauro Ranello being a better commentator than Michael Cole. He's been in the game been in the game longer. Uh, Michael Cole originally started his WWE career just doing the side commentary and the backstage interviews. Eventually, working his way up to the uh, commentary side with with uh, Jerry the King Lawler on uh, SmackDown and Taz. And he worked his way up that way. But the thing is, is Mauro Ranello has been doing it for a longer time. He's been doing a much better job at longer time in different sports. Michael Cole has done wrestling his whole his whole career. Mauro Ranello is barely getting in the mix, yet he's doing a better job than Michael Cole. And that's the sad thing. Um, but like I said, this is probably stemming from the fact that Michael Cole, Michael Cole to me is really... Um, He's just really wearing thin. It's, it's it's good to see a fresh announcer call a pre-show, but for him not having, for Mauro Ranello to not be calling the rest of Fastlane really upsets me because we, to have him do, be the, to have Mauro Ranello signed to a big contract uh, to commentate with WWE and to have him not being used all the time is just really upsetting. It's, uh, it's not a wise financial move, in my opinion, to, to use some, to underutilize someone like that. I know seniority might come into play with Michael Cole and everything, but Michael Cole has another job too. If, if none of you know, he is in charge sometimes actually, you know, he gets the vote in the creative, um, in the creative board decisions with uh, Triple H and all the rest of the uh, the upper tier uh, the upper tier uh, executives in WWE, making you know who goes over who, who do you think should be uh, winning the titles at said events. Anyway, uh, let's go on to the the first match here on the on the card. It was a uh, Sasha Banks and Becky Lynch and versus uh, Naomi and Tamina. Um, to me, this match was okay. Uh, it was a couple of bad, uh, bad bumps that uh, Becky Lynch took, uh, being thrown out of the ring by uh, Naomi, and she didn't catch the rope on the way down to break her fall. She took a bad bump, possibly on her back or her shoulder. Hopefully, she's not hurt. Um, I don't. I haven't heard any injury reports as of now. But geez, this match was—you really could see that Sasha Banks is so over. It's it's not even funny. Um, she's pretty much the most over diva that doesn't have the title. Um, there's going to be a time where Brie Bella is going to have to hang it up. And then you're going to have to, then there's going to be this power vacuum of who's going to be the next diva to take all this attention. Um, it's going to have to be, it's going to have to be Sasha Banks. I mean, you could see it in her charisma and her move set. Uh, and the thing is, too, is Becky Lynch has an incredible move set as well. But I mean, you're dealing with you're dealing with someone that's just the upper tier. Just Sasha Banks is only 24 years old, but yet she's doing these things and so charismatic. Um, she is making the rest of the WWE divas look very bad, and that's not a hard job to do, considering that the only there's only a few good women wrestlers inside that division. Um, you know, Paige, Natalia. You have Sasha Banks, Becky Lynch, and Charlotte. And then you go on to these other players that are just not really good. Not really good wrestlers. I mean, you know, there's divas, there's women wrestlers, and then there's wrestlers. I mean, you got to at least know what you're doing out there. And it just looks very bad when you see certain divas wrestle each other. Um, I thought the match was really good. It really set up. Uh, it really set up Sasha and Becky Lynch to finally face each other at a different time or go in a fatal three-way with Charlotte, whatever comes around. I know that Charlotte and Becky Lynch 
um, had previous beef as so as well as you know all three of them have been in a triangle of of uh, of of beef with each other, and uh, hopefully this can all culminate at WrestleMania, a fatal three way for the title, because in all honesty, those three are the only ones that can really put on a very very good match involving women's you know involving the divas division only three that can do it because at this time i don't see it um i really saw that and to my honest opinion i don't think tamina snooker can even wrestle anymore i think her brute style is really showing uh to to be not effective at all i mean she's very slow in the ring i mean you can literally see that she has a leg brace over her over her over her pants and it's just really imp- impeding her her movement uh, it, and she can't do, I mean, having a knee brace really is going to cut your move set by a lot because you're not able to put much pressure on your knee uh, to do moves and suplexes and slams and stuff like that. Uh, I think she did look fatigued as well. Fatigued as well. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, Becky Lynch uh, started off this match. You get a quick tag from Sasha Banks. Then you get a tag back from Becky. Then you get Becky getting really hurt during the match and then coming over to Sasha Banks at the end to to really get the crowd over and everything. And it was a really good match for her. It was really a showing party for Sasha, Sasha Banks, if anything, because Naomi and Tamina, that, that whole unity thing really doesn't play out. It's really like, you know... You're looking on the you're on the outside looking in on this little click that's really not going anywhere, and it's not going anywhere fast realistically. Um, the next match we had we had uh, Kevin Owens versus Dolph Ziggler for the Intercontinental Title. Dolph Ziggler is a homegrown kid. A lot of homegrown matches too. I mean, Dolph Ziggler's from uh, from uh, Ohio. Huge pop for Kevin Owens. When his uh, song came out, um, very huge pop. Unless that was one of the crowd-fed noises, I mean, it sounded pretty authentic to me. But there was a little pop for a little pop for Dolph Ziggler, and for that to happen, maybe a lot of people don't know that he's, you know, from Cleveland. I mean, uh, from Ohio. That really tells me a lot. But um, back to the match, the match was really good. I think that. Dolph Ziggler has been underutilized his whole time here in the wrestling business. Um, I'm glad he's, you know, the rumor has it that in the next couple of years he's going to be deciding to hang it up. And when it's good for him, it's just one of those guys that you see, man, you literally can see so much charisma from Dolph Ziggler. If he definitely got the push that he was destined for, I'm, you're looking at this guy who could be so over, so over with the crowd. I mean, you're th- looking at the, the Shawn Michaels tier of charisma and the the look that you know that is marketable with the the demographic that you need to connect with in order to go over um to me the match was really good i think uh one thing to point out in the beginning of the match they really tried to have Dolph Ziggler try Matt style wrestling and with that it really looked bad because the thing is is that you a you see the size differential between Dolph Ziggler and Kevin Owens, but the fact of the matter is, is that you see an oversized man being mat wrestled against a smaller man, and with that size difference, and then you see it didn't work because I'm not pretty, I'm not too sure Kevin Owens did college wrestling, but you can definitely see that Dolph definitely did because he was doing some, he was doing some mat work that was really incredible. But it just doesn't pan out because, A, you know, you have a size differential. And if you have someone inexperienced in doing that, it's not going to look good. You're going to be the only one looking good doing it. But then, collectively, together, you guys will not be looking good together doing it. And like I said, as all wrestling goes, one guy could do a good job. But if another guy doesn't do a good job, the whole match is just lower quality. If both guys are at this level... To bring both of them over, then that definitely signifies, uh, actually that definitely certifies it to be a great match. Uh, you have Dolph Ziggler losing to Kevin Owens. Uh, Kevin Owens retains his Intercontinental title. He might be just carrying this Intercontinental title to WrestleMania. Um, he might even win the Money in the Bank one of these days. I mean, it just looks really up and over for Kevin Owens. You definitely see it. I mean... The, the, the company is definitely interested to see what Kevin Owens can provide. 
But um, yeah, I was really, uh, I really thought it was a good match as well, in my opinion. Um, Kevin Owens was definitely a pleasure to see in the ring. Uh, but uh, one thing on Dolph's end, I mean, the super kick is definitely, definitely out of its, you know, it's been wasted so many times. I think people do the super kick so many times. Um, and it's not even a, it's not even a high tier move anymore. It's like one of these moves that you could see anyone doing. Um, good match nonetheless. Um, good showing for Kevin Owens. Dolph Ziggler is just doing his job now that he's just putting over a younger talent. Um, we had the six man tag match with Ryback, Big Show, Kane, uh, Braun Strowman, Luke Harper, and Eric Rowan. And uh, one thing to mention is that Bray Wyatt was not fighting in this match. And watching this match without Bray in the mix is just not entertaining at all. I mean, there was no promo beforehand. I mean, they're definitely on time constraints. But um, uh, definitely things to point out is that Kane definitely looked good. He looked really good in this match. Ryback looked good. Big Show looked good. Um, Braun Strowman, Luke Harper, and Eric Rowan, I mean... Besides Braun Strowman's push, Luke Harper and Eric Rowan were basically taking all the bumps and all the slams during this match to basically tell you that, yeah, Braun Strowman was definitely in the three-man tag, but do not associate him with those two because he's going to get his own push. Uh, report, there's different reports showing that Braun Strowman will definitely get his own push. I mean, his size alone, he is a. I was definitely privileged to see him live, and he is definitely a sight to see he is a huge person um but it was a very good surprise to see ryback show big show and kane actually take this win um it was definitely good to see those guys actually uh get something going um before wrestlemania season starts um but this definitely just to just to put out there it, it definitely should not hinder the push of braun Strowman and bray wyatt um these guys are in a caliber way above Luke Harper and Eric Rowan. Like I said, Luke Harper should be doing his own singles thing. That's just my personal opinion. Um, but just to end on that, really good match. You know, it definitely helped uh, help both parties um, with Bray Wyatt and Braun Strowman only. Uh, definitely helped out uh, Ryback show and Kane get some steam going before WrestleMania starts. Next, we had Charlotte with. Uh, Ric Flair in the corner against Brie Bella. Um, it's a good match. Like I said, you see Charlotte actually does know what she's doing. She does have an impressive move set. Uh, but you can literally see that Brie is not on the same level as any of these NXT any of these NXT talent that came out last year. It is def- it's super apparent. The only thing that's keeping her in this place is is Daniel Bryan's shadow. I mean, she even wore his his little leg his little uh leg pads. So, I mean, she is definitely knowing what she's doing. She's definitely a smart person for actually wearing those and, and for just to, just to wear those. And she actually knows that that's the only thing that's going to put her over now because the moveset she has is not really effective at all. She's barely, she's definitely wearing thin with the WWE universe, in my opinion. I mean, Nikki was the Nikki Bella was the more popular of the Bellas. That's not saying much for her move set, but it's like Brie is not even there as well. Uh, but uh, it's you know good riddance says she's retiring in my opinion. I don't really I'm not really fond of Brie Bella at all. Um, but like I said, for Charlotte to retain, uh, it was I really thought that it was rightful, rightfully so. I mean, Brie. To be honest, this was a force-fed rivalry to fill in before WrestleMania, and that's exactly what it looks like. Um, not too, not too much spent on that. But AJ Styles and Y2J finally, this match becomes reality. Not a lot of people know, but AJ Styles and Y2J have always been in the, you know, just always been in the talks, always been in the mix of like, man, I want to see these two guys fight. Watching these two guys finally wrestle was amazing um you definitely see that aj styles despite his age he definitely has a great array of 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 wrestling offense um but the one thing that just really concerns people like me in general is just the age that you get you know your late 30s or early 40s i mean to wrestle these high quality matches so late in the stage i mean we we got to realize now that AJ Styles is now contractually obligated with WWE for sure. Like that's set in stone. 
Now, can he do the schedule versus uh, different promotions, which only give him appearances here and there? I mean, I, I want to see him go back to his TNA days where he was wrestling every single week. I mean, I want to definitely see this, but I want to make sure that he's able to do it on a regular basis. Um, I, I think he's definitely able to cope with the standard WWE schedule. I definitely see that. Um, when then Y2J is doing a great job himself, I mean, he he's here, gone, here, and gone, and that's good. I mean, you we don't need a lot of Y2J. His def, definitely his promos can wear thin, especially in this day and age where we're really PG. And his method of method of getting heel like tactics going is definitely for a a, de, uh, a more mature crowd. Um, it definitely doesn't work nowadays. But having him every so often, it's always a pleasure to see. I always look forward to seeing him at live events. Um, I was recently at the Ontario SmackDown event, and it was very good to see him. Uh, start stir up the beef that eventually came to fast lane here there in cleveland um i definitely like the match it was a very good match um hopefully aj styles finds a rivalry to come up with to uh, go to wrestlemania and finally get a wrestlemania match hopefully that hopefully vince mcmahon isn't too um you know too prideful and doesn't let him uh, a TNA a New Japan Pro Wrestling a Ring of Honor guy actually have a main event so early in WrestleMania not necessarily a main event but actually a, an event on the card a match on the card at WrestleMania hopefully that comes to fruition I definitely would like to see that definitely I definitely am reinforcing uh nothing but good things about my WWE subscription because not only AJ Styles, not only because of AJ Styles and Y2J, but I mean, we're dealing with a, no, a, a, a who's who of wrestling newcomers that are coming in. It's going to be really surprising very, very soon. Um, going on to the next thing, uh, we have the New Day and the Edge promo. To me, this would have been, uh, like I said, a lot of people are going to be saying this, but this would have been a perfect time to bring Enzo and Cass into the mix instead of having the League of Nations. I mean, it's just, the League of Nations is just started off at the at the racetrack with no spare tires no tires at all as a matter of fact and it's just bad it just this this whole faction is nothing but a stinker um i think i think personally think i personally think that sheamus is force fed upon us i think that king barrett has definitely has never been popular ever since the nexus days i mean now we have rusev who's just this brute that doesn't really do anything at all besides him besides the only good thing about him is that every time you know rusev would come out more than likely lon is going to come out but nowadays it's you're not seeing that and it's just the league of nations to me is just crap the only good thing i like about it is alberto del rio i'm very impressed by his moveset i mean alberto del rio to me alberto del rio to me is definitely better than all three of them better than the rest of the three of the league of nations anyway the new day and the edge promo basically starts out with edge and christian doing their thing and the new day come out to try to rile them up and then after they down downplay the uh league of nations the league of nations come out they're definitely upset and they try to cut their own promo on the end there and then the edge christian and new day unite just to do one more shot at the league of nations definitely worked um, I definitely don't want to see uh, New Day get any more heat than what they did in Cleveland because you're dealing with the sport. You're dealing with the sports uh, sports city that hasn't won a, a title of any sort in any championship uh, in any sport in over 150 years. They really do take it to heart. I would, I would too, if I was a Cleveland uh, a citizen of Cleveland. It's just really bad to not have a championship in any regard. To be good to be not talented in any sport for a hundred, that long of time is just unimpressive uh as the city as a whole anyway um what i really enjoyed is that end zone cash should have debuted but they didn't hopefully they're going to debut sometime after wrestlemania because trying to build up before wrestlemania for them to do a match would be really accelerated really force fed they should have done that fast lane to build up because the viewership would have been there to see them. NXT NXT uh, familiars would have saw that. But no, they didn't. Um, on to the next thing on the on the uh, docket here. We have R-Truth and Curtis Axel. Um, I really think this, this match came out of nowhere. Uh, it was too high in the card to begin with. It was really... 
accelerated for time. I think this I think this match was literally brought out for time constraints. I I really do think so because it just looked really fo- like really really loose. And what I mean by that is just everything looked like, oh man, this this looks like everyone's cutting the promos all quick. There's this and that. I mean, you definitely see that these guys, these social outcast guys, aren't really getting over with the crowd. These these guys are really being shoved down our throats, and the, these guys definitely should be out by next year. I think all of them. Adam Rose is too old. Bo Dallas is not getting over. His whole gimmick is crap. Heath Slater has a legitimate chance to at least do something, but I mean, the Mike skills and his move set are the only thing that's keeping him in. And you know, Curtis Axel's. I don't even need to say anything about him. Everyone knows. I mean, as soon as I mention Curtis Axel, you get this uneasy feeling. Um, on to the main event. Got five minutes here. I had Dean Ambrose, Roman Reigns, and Brock Lesnar. Huge pop. Huge pop for Dean. There's zero for Roman Reigns. Everyone goes nuts for Brock Lesnar. I mean, seeing this guy in person is incredible. Um, he definitely is a, a magnet for for cheers, and he is definitely over with the fans. He's definitely a superstar. He's not at the tier of you know your rocks, your stone colds. I mean, because he doesn't have mic skills to put him over, but he definitely is a force to be to be sought after, to be desired. He is definitely still in great shape to be doing all the moves he needs to do. I know he's suplex heavy on doing on his move set, but I mean. Jeez, this guy is, a, is is his image is marketed as a beast, and that is so rightfully so. The match starts off. Dean Ambrose doing this wild gimmick where he's just doing all this crazy crap to Brock. Uh, we're talking like we're talking just random punches and stuff, but that doesn't phase Brock. They end up they Dean and Roman end up putting Brock Le, uh, Brock Lesnar through two announce tables. Um, and with that being said, they go back in and try to do their own match. Um, the, one of the best, the best spots of the night is when Brock Lesnar actually picks up Dean Ambrose and Roman Reigns in a suplex crowd goes nuts. It was incredible. Very good feat of athleticism. I definitely appreciated that. The, the crowd definitely appreciated that. I mean, you heard a massive pop, you heard suplex city all night. Um, but after Brock Lesnar was brought through the second announce table, did his move. I mean, you definitely saw that this was going to go Roman Reigns' way, and I didn't want it to. I mean, especially since Dean Ambrose was in Cleveland, you know, in Cleveland, Ohio. Ohio's his home state. I mean, this could have been a great thing for the whole state of Cleveland. I mean, that would have been very positive, very good, but it didn't happen. Roman Reigns is definitely being shoved down our throats. I've never been a big fan of him. I'm, I'm definitely good that he went over that one time during uh when Vince McMahon made a cameo on Raw but this just 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 doesn't work when you force feed this guy who hasn't changed his apparel since the shield who hasn't changed the theme song hasn't been repackaged nothing has worked he's I mean he's done theater lessons he's done acting lessons this guy just doesn't work I mean he what how many Samoan drops how many Superman punches and how many spears are we gonna have to see and wait till this guy just just goes to the mid card or something I mean this guy is not gonna he might be the face of WWE because he sells merch but definitely you'll definitely hear it night in and night out that this guy definitely does not bode well with WWE fans and I luckily I'm staying in it. I mean I definitely like WWE for what it is, but you'll definitely see day in and day out that people are gonna be losing I mean, they're gonna be canceling their subscriptions. And when that crap hits the fan, you'll definitely see that they're gonna change it up. But they should not change it up for they should not change it up when it's too late. They should just do it now we have to get this wrestle this WrestleMania thing out. We have to have him to have his WrestleMania moment and then hopefully we can get all that out of the way. Anyway, I want to wrap up here guys. This is my first podcast I'm going to have going. I'm going to try to do it every so often. I have news to give you guys to give proper insight. Um we're closing on the final 30 seconds, but like I said, it was an average it was just an average pay-per-view build up to WrestleMania. I mean, it's definitely not uh probably better than last year's fast. It was definitely better than last year's fast lane, but uh to be honest, I'm really disappointed of the main event. Everything else was okay. Um 
But nonetheless, this is Mark Flores with uh, my wrestling podcast. I definitely want to talk to you guys later. Have a good night. Stay safe. Be safe out there.